Hey everybody, welcome to the episode. This is a grief survival guide episode. Uh, I think it's like episode 24 or 25 of the grief guide. This is how the grief stole Christmas. I'm so proud of that title. I thought of it in my sleep at like 2 a.m. and I texted Deb and I was like, this is what we're going to call it. And you're going to have to make me look like the Grinch. And grief can be like a Grinch. That's what made me think of it. Because I was thinking about my past few Christmases, these past few years, and what it felt like to be without my parents and what it felt like to grieve and grieve during a time that's supposed to be so happy. Like the holidays are supposed to be so happy until you reach a certain age and then you're responsible for everything. You're like, oh, the decorations don't just decorate themselves. The hot cocoa just doesn't hot cocoa itself. The presents just don't buy themselves. <laughs> There's like this shift that happens from childhood to adulthood where the holidays start to become a little tedious because you create the magic for whoever's in your life. And, and when you're going through loss or have experienced loss, the holidays can be so triggering. And that's why I wanted to dedicate an entire episode to what happens with grief around the holiday season, around Christmas time. I know everyone's supposed to say happy holidays because we have to include every single person and every single sentence and every single show and movie that we ever make or create. So everyone feels protected. But for me, it was Christmas. I celebrate Christmas. I've always celebrated Christmas. And it honestly, since I was a little girl was and is one of my most favorite holidays. And it's changed throughout the years because of the loss of my parents and having to experience Christmas differently as an adult without her parents is such a challenging rite of passage, really what it is. It's a challenging rite of passage to find what that holiday means without the people who you've spent a majority of the holidays with being there. And my mom made Christmas so special. She handmade ornaments. She handmade decorations. She had her own business. My mom was a business woman. She used to sew. I didn't say it was a real successful business. <laughs> I mean, success is a spectrum, isn't it? Success is such a spectrum. It depends on what you deem successful. And I think for my mom, she just liked to provide for people. She just liked to make people feel good. And I know that because I knew her my entire life. But also I know that because I'm reading her journal currently. And it's a journal that she spent a year writing in. I think the year of 1987, which would make me not even alive. Thank you. I was five. And I've read it for a few reasons. I've read it to keep in touch with her and I've read it for a little bit of inspiration for the book that I'm working on about my father and before I go too deep into the Nancy story I want to let you guys know at the end of the episode and throughout this episode I'm going to share some of my tips or experiences in dealing with grief and how to not make it steal your Christmas how to be able to experience Christmas in a different way without the ones that you love and how to keep them with you in, in different ways throughout the years and especially during the holiday season where we miss them the most. But my mother was such an interesting person and I know so much about why she did what she did and how she did what she did in making these little sewing gifts. She had a business called Puff and Stuff by Nancy <laughs> Puffin Stuff by Nancy Peluso. It was Finley, but then she married my dad. So, and she made her own little tags. She made her own little, like, you know, the tags on a shirt. It said Puffin Stuff by Nancy Finley, and then it went to Nancy Peluso. And she make these, like, things that say Merry Christmas or, you know, Happy Holidays. And she would write it all out and cut it and fill it with the stuff and sew it up and... And she really enjoyed doing that. She really enjoyed sharing. I guess that you can say it's her art. All of her sisters were artistic and she was always so creative. I know she charged people because I saw that there was like a little box of money where she kept her sewing kit. So she's not doing this stuff for free, right? She's not completely, she's not a saint. Nancy wasn't a saint. She's out here 
charging people for puffing stuff. And I don't know what the going rate was then. I don't know what she's charging these people for a Merry Christmas handmade Nancy Puffin stuff decor. We got to put it on eBay and see what it goes for today. We got to take this thing to the Antiques Roadshow. You've got an authentic... <laughs> we have an original, authentic Puffin stuff by Nancy Finley, 1987 season. Oh, buddy, you better dig deep. Your whole, you and your family are going to be, be able to retire on this Merry Christmas Puffin stuff. Anyways, my mother would decorate the, the entire house and she made Christmas feel like this isolated moment in our life. And it felt so magical. The lighting and the smells in the house, besides like the dog and my dad, it smelled so Christmassy. And she really took pride in that. And I think, I know because of how she was raised, she was raised on a farm with many siblings and an absent father who was an alcoholic and abusive man with her mom and her six siblings. My, you know, my grandma took care of all of them. And I think when you grow up in a household like that and a childhood like that, in your mind, you think of what life could be like and you sort of daydream more and you dream about the type of life you want or the life you want to run away to. And I think my mom made that life with us. And that's why the holidays were always so special to her. So Christmas is a very special time for me because of my mom. And I know my dad really appreciated that as well because he grew up in a similar scenario. My father had um, a couple siblings with his mom and then his father had a whole other family. My grandfather had two families at once. It was, you know, like a one of those buy one, get one deals at Payless, but for people. <laughs> I know it's not it's not funny, but it is. Everyone's fine. I mean, most of us made it out alive. A couple of us are still dealing with the darkness back in Syracuse. But hey, you know, you win you win some, you lose some. But both of my parents came from very humble beginnings, and I think for my mother, that's what made her want to make the holidays so special, and that's why the holidays became so special for me. It's amazing how much of your likes and dislikes are just reflections of your parents likes and dislikes we become carbon copies so often in so many different ways and i'm glad that the christmas spirit is still alive for me because of my mother even though she dead she's so dead and my dad is so dead and we're going to talk about ways to keep them alive and also ways to understand how to cope with the death and, and what the death can mean for you and the death evolves so much the meaning of death and your relationship to death and grieving evolves so much. It's evolved so much for me. I know people listening to this podcast and the ones who have maybe listened to all of the grief survival guide episodes, it's a freaking roller coaster. This grief is a roller coaster. It's such a ride. It's such a freaking emotional ride. And it's a it's a lifetime pass. It's not a season pass, sis. You're stuck on the grief roller coaster for the rest of your life. Just when you think you're getting off, no, 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 no. A truck hit somebody and they did not survive. And then you just get over that. Oh, I'm good. No, 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 no. Recession. What? Just when you start to save some money. No, 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 no. You got a weird lump on your left lymph node. There's constant grief and trauma that keeps us on these highs and lows and ebbs and flows of life. So grief is a spectrum in of itself. It doesn't just deal with the loss of people. And I think all of the lessons of grief that I have learned can sort of be appreciated in all those different areas where grief is ever present. And the past few Christmases for me have been so difficult. And it's so funny how you don't realize how deep you are in, in something until you get out of it. You don't realize how much of a hold something has on you until you let go of it a little bit or it let, lets go of you. And, you know, I was going to wear something specific today because grief comes with an outfit. I don't know if you know that, but there is grief wear. And I might have to design a whole line of grief wear for the different stages of grief because you dress very differently depending on the stage that you're in. For me, I fluctuated only minimally 
And I was going to wear the outfit that I wore the most while I was grieving and I didn't even know it. And it took a fan saying something about me appearing on some podcast. Do you remember that podcast, Deb? I don't know if we talked about this. There was some episode where somebody said it was nice to see me dressed like something other than a homeless woman. Do you remember that? I think it might have been the Sickler podcast. So I have, I was in the dark about how I looked. And I thought about wearing what I wore for years during my deepest grief because it became comfort to me. And every time I look at this sweatshirt, it's a hoodie. Grief wear is, is basically for me all hoodies. Hoodies and sweatpants. And for a lot of people, that was their quarantine wear. And we were low-key grieving during quarantine. We didn't even know. People were like, what happened? Girl, you were grieving. We were grieving because we didn't know what was going on. So my favorite sweatshirt, and I, I, I was going to wear it, but I'm like, no, I don't want to wear it. I'm going to wear my cute new Marshalls Aaliyah throwback t-shirt that I got for $10.99 at the boys' sale rack. Yes, sir. I decided to wear this as a little, you know, homage to my 90s hip hop. The sweatshirt that I wore, speaking of 90s, is this gray sweatshirt with Sade on it. And that became what I wore the most during <laughs> the few years where I was in the deepest throes of grief. And I was a recluse. Grief can really change your personality, and I think it has to. Grief is interesting. It's not something to be cured. It's something to be endured. It's not something you need to get over. It's something you have to go through. And it's not something that needs to be fixed because the very nature of grief is essentially fixing you. And I thought I was broken. I thought something was wrong with me. And I thought this was just how I was going to be forever. And I was totally reclusive during the holidays. I was on autopilot. I would come downstairs and go back up and just sit and lay and stare and think and feel and cry and I look back at the things I posted and the work I was doing work quote unquote play I consider this play but it is my job and it's a lot different it's it's definitely I can see how I'm in a transitional period and and now coming out of that I'm I'm excited to be able to do different and in, in, uh, not more important material, but just material that I feel completely connected to because when you're going through grieving and when you're going through grief, you're completely flailing. And I wasn't 100% connected to being an entertainer. I didn't feel entertaining. So I want to say thank you for everybody who's stuck along with this podcast and who's found something out of these episodes and who has been able to connect during a time where I felt a very hard time connecting with myself and being able to put out entertainment for you guys. So I really appreciate anyone who is connected with that. I was looking for a place to land my sad little plane the entire time. I think that's what you're doing while you're grieving and going through that is you're just looking for some place to freaking land. You just want to land and you don't want to do anything. You want to lay and, and put food in your face. And watch Shits Creek over and over and over. I watched Shits Creek. You know what saved me? Shits Creek, Virgin River, and reruns of Rick and Morty. That became my comfort zone. A little bit of Mary J, a little bit of the blood of Christ, and rinse and repeat. I'm not saying it's the healthiest way. That was part of my process. And I will be doing an episode I'm curating and have been curating for a while, an episode about how to entertain your grief, shows to watch, music to listen to, places to go, and just ways to entertain your grief. We don't even consider that. Like, grief is something that you can play with. And like I said before, it's not your, it shouldn't be your goal, in my opinion, to try to change it or get rid of it or get it out of your life. Grief is there. You just have to find a way to make it fit into your into your livelihood, into your life, into your existence. And so for the past few Christmases, it's been heavy and I haven't really felt fun and happy and in the Christmas spirit. And this year is the first time I felt 
so excited for Christmas. I decorated in November. <laughs> I was like, it's the holiday season. People were putting up Halloween decorations. I'm like, what are you doing? Wrong holiday. Chris Kringle's going to be here in 64 days. How dare you? Don't step on his toes. Don't forget about All Saints Nick. Oh, or was it Nick? Uh, the Eva Saint Nick? I think that's what my mom used to call it. I don't even know if it was a real holiday. I'm going to have to look this up. My mom used to do this. The Eve of St. Nick. You guys ever hear that? The Eve of St. Nick? Let's see if we've got anything or if it was just something that Nancy made. The Eve of St. Nicholas. Okay, it's a real thing. It's uh, My mom used to do it on December 5th. Let's see what Wikipedia says. It's also called the Feast of St. Nicholas, ob observed on the 5th or 6th of December in Western Christian countries. What did I just say? <laughs> in western christian countries and on december 19 in eastern christian countries uh it was a day a feast day of saint nicholas of myra it falls within the season of advent okay this all starts to sound like a cult it's a christian festival particular regard to saint nicholas he had a reputation of bringer of gifts so what my mom would do was she would put tell us to put our stocking or slipper out in the hallway and i guess this guy would come and put stuff in it that's not creepy even though Christmas is magical, it still, I think, created a lot of material for us to be terrified. Just some guy coming in and leaving gifts and leaving. What what happened? What what did what did this guy do to you that he owes us so much? And why is he going throughout the whole neighborhood? So the Eva St. Nick was on December 5th, and my mom would just put a bunch of stuff in our slipper. And that was actually. This is going to be a spoiler alert for a lot of you out there. If you have any young ears listening to the podcast, I hope you don't because this podcast is not made for young ears for children. But here comes a spoiler alert. I found out Santa wasn't real because of the eve of St. Nicholas and Emily Jane Peluso's big fat mouth. My sister's big fat mouth. So on the morning after the eve of St. Nick, so December 6th, probably sometime in early the early 90s. I grab my slipper. I grab my slipper. And I'm eating I'm eating the the lollipop out of it and I'm trying to taste the flavor and I'm in the kitchen with my mom and my sister and I'm like, "Oh, this is ch cherry? I don't know what flavor this is." And my sister goes, "It's black raspberry." And I go, "Well, how do you know?" And she's like, "I picked it out." And I said, "Huh?" And I looked at my mom and that's where my whole world came crashing in in the kitchen on the north side of Syracuse, New York, with Emily Jane Peluso's loud, fat mouth telling me that she was St. Nick. And if she was St. Nick, then who was Santa Claus? Nancy? Puffin Stuff's very own Nancy freaking Finley? Are you kidding me right now? I, <laughs> I needed a moment. I was like, this is not okay. Highly inappropriate. I was 17, but still... My dreams were broken. My dreams were completely crashed. But, you know, I guess for me, being able to sort of get out of the funk I've been in made me want to share all of the lessons I've learned from grief and specifically around Christmas and feeling so damn bad about it. And I, I feel good to feel good about it for the first time decorating so early I got a tree I got stuff to wrap around the tree I even put fake gifts underneath it I got a blanket with Christmas trees on it okay I got candles I'm not messing around it looks like I went and robbed a Marshalls TJ Maxx Ross and in home goods all in one day not gonna say I didn't but it feels good to sort of have the spirit back and there's something you know, there's a, a few quotes that I wanted to share with you guys, but there's this one spe specific guy that I listen to often. There's Wayne Dyer on, on YouTube who I listen to when I take car rides or long drives. And then there's also this Dr. Joe Dispensa, who's like, I guess like a meditation, um, a metaphysics professor and he's got an interesting background. I don't know a whole lot about him, but I do enjoy his web, uh, his videos on, on YouTube. And I do think he has a very interesting outlook and in, in where he's dedicated his time. He has a way to sort of get you out of your own head. 
it's kind of like therapy. It's also very, it's, it's very accessible in the way that he tells you the ways that you can get caught up. And he's very much into meditation. He's very much into healing yourself through your mind. And his whole philosophy is kind of like, well, if your thoughts can hurt you, they can heal you. And I believe that. I'm a, I'm a big believer in that. And the world you create within your mind becomes the world that you live in, in the physical world. And he said something that has stuck with me. He said, you never know how distracted your mind is until you're left with yourself. And I know we're not necessarily talking about distraction when we're talking about grief, but when you're left with yourself and left with grief and sitting with it, something really interesting happens and something really powerful happens where you start to unwind parts of yourself and you don't even know you're doing this. I honestly think it's a way that your spirit, your mind and your body, your survival mechanisms, your survival uh, systems are trying to help you heal by getting rid of on a conscious or maybe subconscious level, getting rid of the behaviors and the thoughts and thought processes that are holding us back in order to be able to heal even more. I do believe our bodies are capable of immense healing and amazing healing on a, on a automatic level and on a subconscious level. And if you can just kick into gear a little bit of a conscious thought to that, an intentional thought along with the unconscious process that's happening, I think it's limitless to a certain extent, the amount of healing you can do on your own when you're left with yourself. And when I was left with myself for a couple of years, which it was, like I said, a very reclusive time, I learned a lot about how I was. I learned a lot about the type of people that were in my life. And I started to do some deep, deep house cleaning. You do some real deep house cleaning. That's one of the greatest aspects of grieving is it arms you with this sort of resilience if you allow it to at least it did for me it made me feel much more resilient and because of that resilience I started to realize the people in in places and behaviors that were holding me back and whether it was a concerted effort or a result of where I was in the grieving process I started to peel away those aspects of myself and give myself a little bit of space. And I think that's what grief does. It creates a lot of space. And I think because I've, I'm where I'm at in the process of it, I I believe we grieve forever. I believe when you have the bond that I had with my mom and my father, both collectively and individually, I'll grieve them for the rest of my life. But I think the notion and the connotation of what grief means is something that you can create for yourself. When I say I I will grieve them for the rest of my life, I'm not just saying I'll be sad that they're gone. I'm basically saying what my relationship will be with them. I will have to learn how to love them, how to experience them, how to remember them, how to continue the best parts of them through the grieving process for myself. So when I say I'll be grieving them for the rest of my life, that's not a negative connotation. While there are some sadnesses associated with that while there are some real heavy emotions around that it still is a very beautiful experience if you can look at it that way even in the hardest parts even in the parts where you're like fuck I just want to call my mom I just want to talk to my dad even in days like that it can still be a beautiful thing if you allow it and if you have the capability of making some amends if you need to with those relationships. So I want to go into sort of some of the ways that I have been able to heal and deal with grief. But before we do that, I made a promise. Some people made a request about what they want me to talk about. People mentioned they want me to do some more coffin reviews. (laughs) Death can be funny. I don't care what anyone says. Crazy things happen when people die. People say dumb stuff and, you know, grief and death brings out so much in people and you really you really start to understand how clueless we are when it comes to etiquette and uh, just the process that you have to deal with after someone dies there's so many clinical things you need to know and 
you have to deal with funeral homes. And my dad, when he died and was being delivered to the funeral home for his funeral, they brought him someplace else. This guy used to get lost all the time in life. He even got lost in death. They literally delivered my dad. To, I don't even know where they brought him. We're like, where is he? How, how, how do you, how are you dead? And you still can't find your way to your funeral. My dad got lost on his way to his own funeral. Come on. Are you kidding me? And then people just assume when someone dies, you get all this money. People don't become rich when they die. I, I, I don't know where that information is. People just assume everyone's got a fat will. Yeah, you've got to feed into that. You've got to work. You got to create revenue during your life in order to have a sweet will. We were left with like seven beer tabs, two stray cats, and four Buicks. <laughs> okay, so there's this website, Titan Casket, where I first came across, I think it was a, a bunch of Grief Survival Guide episodes past that had just the most ridiculous reviews. I didn't even know that people, you know, I guess people review everything. Coffin reviews on, are on another level. So there's the Titan Caskets. I just want, or no, they're Trusted Caskets. This is this one website. There's also Titan Caskets, but I'm going to read a couple of the reviews from Trusted Caskets. This is the a type of casket. It's called a Titan Virtue Cardboard Casket. Yikes. That doesn't sound sturdy whatsoever. Uh, I think you can get that just after a couple Amazon deliveries. This is from David in Greer, South Carolina. He says, the size is good. Instruction's good. Some of the tabs did not seem long enough to hold together. Due to the fear of it falling apart, I used white duct tape. Huh? You what? I'm sorry. Did I read it correctly that you put white duct tape on your cardboard casket? Who the F is getting buried in that? Who wasn't loved? Somebody was not loved. I'm going to tell you, my squirrel got a better burial than that. <laughs> Skilo got a better burial than that. In my heart, he did. I wasn't there when he passed away. My neighbor threw him in the trash. But had I been there, Skilo would have gotten a, a very expensive mahogany silkworm lined casket. Probably too big. And I would have put all sorts of jewels in there like he was some sort of freaking pharaoh. This guy wants to use white duct tape in the cardboard casket. Was the duct tape used to kill the person you're putting into the casket? All these materials seems like they were used in a murder. I hope David had a wonderful funeral for whoever that was for. Somebody was not loved. Okay, this is for an Orion series dark blue casket with light blue interior. Gender reveal. <laughs> That'd be a great gender reveal. You open the casket. Oh my God, grandma was a grandpa. Okay, this is from Susan in Northville, Michigan. When the casket was closed and after the key was tightly turned to lock, notice the upper and bottom portion did not meet with a one-fourth gap. The math, not the casket math. It was disturbing to see, but too late to do anything. Why are people locking people in caskets? I, I didn't even know that they, do they try to get out? Are the dead trying to escape? Is this a standard thing? Should we be locking caskets? What if it's made out of cardboard and white duct tape? Does the white duct tape ask, act as the, as the lock? I'm so confused. What are you trying to keep inside, Susan? What did you bury? Freaking werewolf? Nobody go to Northville, Michigan. Because apparently the dead are so strong that they need to lock them in the casket so they don't escape. I'm not going to sleep. This was my favorite review. This was for the father casket, which is a metal casket in monarch blue and silver with blue interior. A lot of details for the dead. I love this. It's like, is the interior blue or pink? Because if she wakes up and sees this, this is from Allison Stevenson. I don't know if I should have said her whole name, but that's okay. Allison said, dad loved it. Very comfortable. What? How do you know? 
Are you test driving the caskets? Or did dad tell you that? Because I hate to tell you, I don't think dad's dead. And I think all of these people have committed a crime. You guys have got to re- read Coffin Reviews. It's just r- ridiculous. If you dig and see what people say, dad loved it. And it was comfortable. And I don't know if this is somebody who just has some time on their hands and they want to be silly and they're making reviews on, on the caskets. Or if somebody's like, yeah, dad loved it. He, he sent me a DM, a, a posthumous DM. Shout out to Trusted, trusted Caskets and also Titan Caskets for the reviews. Let's read one more. Uh, overall, very satisfied. I would recommend the Titan Casket based on my experience. I'll, I'll, how many times have you been in one, sir? I can see there being a whole underworld of people who like to take caskets for a ride, who just probably sleep in them and think that they're vampires, who probably wake in the night and drink blood. I guarantee you that there's going to be some Netflix documentary series about the casket people. This guy says a service and follow through were excellent. Staff was most helpful every step, very responsive. My only disappointment, I love this. I love when people are disappointed in caskets. My only disappointment was an imperfection to the lid at the end of the casket. It was tough. It, and it was though as someone had taken a soft rubber mallet and hit the lid gently, enough so the wood itself was slightly dented. When you caught it in the right light, it the fact that it was both the same on both ends was interesting. The casket itself was beautiful besides these slight marks. So was somebody trying to get out or did they put a dead body in the casket and the casket fell? It seems like maybe all caskets should come with wheels and a sunroof because it seems like the dead are trying to get out of them. Maybe we need to make them more comfortable and, and able to wheel around town so they can go out and have a good time. There was also a question I wanted to address that was asked in our Dr. P episode a couple episodes back from, I, I, I don't, I think it's Amaya. It's Ina Maya. I, I don't know if that's your whole name, just the way it's written, I-N-A-M-A-Y-G. She asked or stated, getting through the holidays as an orphan with no family here in the States is so depressing. Now, when you say here in the States, I'm going to assume that you don't live here. You're not from here. You don't, you're not from here. Now, I am myself an orphan. My sister and I call each other orphans since our mother and father have both passed. And it is an interesting feeling. I have equated it to the feeling of feeling untethered, where you don't have your foundation, your genetic foundation and your parental foundation there anymore. I also had this thought, Enamaya YG, that a very interesting thought, and it kind of made me feel even more untethered. But that untethered is essentially, when you look at it on a positive, uh, in, in a positive perspective, that untethered is essentially freedom. You're free. You're freed up. There's space. And, and that is not necessarily a negative. There's a lot you can do with space and time. And, and I had this thought that I don't, I don't have any parents. There's no grandparents. There are no elderly relatives like that in my life. And I also don't have any children. So in, this, in a sense, I feel completely alone, but not in a completely negative way. It's a really weird feeling to not feel pulled towards my parents or pulled towards a child, to not be responsible or having to consider growing and rearing a child or taking care of and supporting an elderly parent. And at times it's lonely for sure. At times it's a little scary because I feel directionless in a sense where I feel that familial purpose is sort of missing. But then it it gives me an opportunity to go, okay, well, what can I do with that feeling? How can I turn this pain into purpose? How can I turn this confusion into some sort of productivity? Because I'm a productivity queen. I'm always looking for a to-do or 
something to make. Maybe I need a puff and stuff by Jesse Palouse. So what I've decided and what I have felt is that I can still be that person for friends and for people in my life and people who I love and the family that I still have. I can still have that relationship in a different sense, in a different direction. And I can create a direction for myself within my own world and the people who are in my world now. All is not lost. If you keep your mind and your heart open, there are some solutions and ways to navigate being in grief and being in a time in your life where you feel untethered, where you feel lost and you feel directionless. Um, I think I want to do a quick guide, gift guide, because I promised you guys a gift guide. And then I'm going to get into a couple more lessons that I've learned from grief. So I, I wanted to do a gift guide for you guys. It's the holiday season. This is a bonus episode for you. And Christmas is next week. Most of you hopefully have gotten all of your shopping done. I thought I need to evolve everything. One of the ways that I learned about grief and how to cope with grief is to change your tradition. That's one of the things I read. That one of the ways you can sort of mitigate the heavy emotional burden and the emotional state that comes with feeling grief and being in a grieving state is to change your tradition and to do something new and to create newness. And with the holidays, it's always centered in buying and commercialism and so many gifts. My niece and nephew just rip through everything. It, it, it doesn't even look like it's Christmas morning. It just looks like someone's being robbed. And someone is. It's my brother-in-law and my sister. Their bank account is being robbed by five-year-olds. Five-year-olds have so much power. But I thought about all the commercialism surrounding Christmas and how it is a little bit of a commercial holiday, even though it's great to give gifts. But let's be real. When we die, none of this comes with us. And one of the things that people in their final hour request or wish for is more time. And so I thought this year I would find a way to give a moment over Amazon or give my presence instead of a present. And there's so many ways you can do that as a gift. So I thought that I would give you a little bit of uh, a little list of ideas for different people in your life that you could offer this presence present, if you will. So your mom, a gift for your mom, whether it's your stepmom, your adoptive mom, your mother, your mother who runs the brothel, wherever you live, whoever that mother figure is. I I recommend doing what I would do with my mom. We'd go to Marshall's and we'd go to Panera. Yes, we would. You can call us what you want to call us. You can call us um, upstate losers. You can call us basic bitches. But we would love to go to Marshall's and we would go to Panera and eat our little bread and salad combo like queens. Looking at the $144 that we just spent on stuff at Marshall's that we did not need. Now, I know I included commercialism in that, but... It's not about what you bought at Marshall's. It's about the time you spent with your mother at Marshall's and Panera. Are they the, is Panera the greatest place to eat? No, they make everything in a plastic bag. But it's the experience. And every time I'm at Marshall's, I think of my mom. When I'm at Panera, I think of how many times her and I did that and how great it was. So instead of maybe going to Marshall's to buy your mom something, bring her there. You guys can do your shopping together, go and have lunch afterwards and just have an afternoon day drink and go have a good time. Now for your dad, your father figure, whoever that is, my dad was a very particular person. He loved to spend time with us. You know, he loved to go to his bar. So we would give him gift certificates for his bar because that was his social hour. But my dad was specific. My dad always wanted cotton. So I would actually buy stuff for my father. And my father loved socks, Hanes 100% cotton V-neck tagless shirts, white. And he'd love underwear. So, so basically, what we got for my dad was like a homeless man's essentials bag. And he loved it. But for my father and I, what we would do, and this is something that I don't know if it's evolved or changed or is completely gone from our culture. I hope it's not. My dad and I would go to the movies. I would see everything. I, literally, even if the movie looked bad, it just was one of my favorite things to do. And now that's sort of changed because of streaming. 
my father and I would go to the movies. I would take him to the movies. We'd do the concession stand. Joe Peluso would load up on all the treats and we'd have a great little afternoon. And I still, up until recently, this is crazy. I like to keep things. I'm a sentimental person. I kept every single movie, st <clears throat> movie stub ticket from almost every single movie I'd ever seen. And a majority of those were with my father. And I let them go in the process of grief. I had let all of them go because I realized I didn't need the stub. That it was the moment that I was hanging on to. So who else do we have on the list here? A single mom. I have a list for a single mom and a single dad. So a single mom's a special person. They, I have a new appreciation and a new uh, respect for single moms. Not that my sister's one, but just being a mother in general is difficult. But a single mom, this is my request, my recommendation for what you should get for a single mom. A spa day. You know, they just want to be rubbed and left alone. Most moms just don't want to hear mom. They just want to be left alone. They want to be rubbed and left the F alone. They don't want to hear their name. They don't want to hear mom. They just want to sit in a room, a dark room. They don't even have to be touched, probably. They don't even have to be touched. I'm doing this for my sister, and she's not even a single mom. Another thing you can do for a single mom is get them a babysitter. Pay for a babysitter or show up and babysit. Offer anything you can offer to give that mom a freaking break would be my recommendation for a single mom's Christmas gift. Now, a single dad, set up his dating profile. Set up his dating profiles. Help him. Give him a makeover. Mostly, they're going to need a makeover. We're going to have to get rid of the, the weird flavor saver that these guys grow. Some of them grow weird facial hair and they create jaw lines. We have to stop all of that. We need a new hair color. We need a new outfit. We need you to get out of these dungaree pants that you've been wearing for ever since you were in high school. If you're a man who wears pants with a straight cut and it's wide and you have a belt and it comes underneath some body part, we got to change it. We're going to change it up. We're going to get you a new girlfriend. That's what you're going to get for Christmas. Now, on the list, I thought of my brother-in-law, the guy who has it all. What do you get the guy who has it all? The dude who seems to have everything and he's so hard to shop for. You know what those people, those most difficult people to buy for still love? Food. Who doesn't love food? Get him a gift certificate to your favorite restaurant so you can go together. So you got to be creative this holiday season. Get him a gift certificate to his favorite freaking restaurant. Okay, because everybody knows any way through to a man's heart is through his stomach. And also a few stops below that. Wink, wink, if you know what I'm saying. Bring him to a restaurant. Make sure it's one you like. And you go together and you're like, isn't this great? This is my Christmas gift for you and for me. I love food. Let's get some extra bread to bring home so you can make us French toast in the morning. Stefan, what do you get for kids? Very difficult. I think children are hard to buy for because you have to resist the urge to get them something that keeps them on a device. So my recommendation for kids, get them something they can make with their hands. Art projects, things they can put together that's quiet. I made the mistake of buying loud stuff for a couple years. My sister's like, I'm going to murder you. You bought my Tasmanian Devils, something that bings and dings and, and, and makes noise and plays music. I'm going to murder you. So get them the quietest present you can get because essentially whatever you're getting for the kid is a gift for the parent. So occupy the kid's mind figure out what the kid has an affinity for and if it's a quiet thing buy them that and the last person on my gift guide list is for elderly people they're probably the easiest people to buy for or to at least give a gift for around the holiday season and they don't even have to be your elderly people and i say that because of what the gift is and this is something my sister and i have talked about we both have said how pulled in how how much we love and how much of a pull we have towards elderly people i i find them and have always found them fascinating they come with so much wisdom and have lived through historic times and in very difficult eras and seeing the change from invention of technology and and the overuse of cell phones and they have so much experience and such a wealth of knowledge that my gift suggestion for elderly people in your life and maybe people who you don't even know is time give them your time spend time with them and if there's somebody who you love and who you've grown up with and they may not have a lot of time left on this earth ask them questions and record it 
I don't, you know, often recommend to tell people to make content and be on their cell phones and, and all of that. But I think with people that are elderly, their story will get lost. And there was this thing in New York City back in the day called Story Corps where they had these booths set up, I think in Grand Central Station. And you could go in there with somebody and record a story. It essentially was a makeshift podcast before podcasts were a thing. And they would give you the the file of it afterwards. And there's so many ways to record now. I'm not saying to go and use that, but I thought of that when I was doing a little bit of research for this episode. Go and spend time with them and record questions. Ask them questions. Ask them about their childhood and what they experienced, the music they listened to, places they went. Not only just for the documentation of it, but to help them reminisce. Because reminiscing is such a beautiful thing to share with one another. And it also makes somebody feel really good to walk down memory lane, even if they get a little emotional. Sometimes the, the elderly and the old people can get a little emotional thinking about what once was and who they once were with and who they once were. But allowing them to revisit them, essentially you're giving them the gift of being in a time that they miss and being able to experience and and revisit some of their favorite memories, I feel would be a gift for them as well. So I hope, hopefully that helps you. Hopefully that gives you a little inspiration for the people in your life. And there's a couple quotes I wanted to tell you guys. I was looking and trying to find different quotes and, you know, there's that one quote, I think by Queen Elizabeth about grief, that it is, um, I'm gonna have to freaking Google it. I think it's grief is the price of love, of loving someone. Grief is the price we pay of loving someone. Let's see if I, price we pay for love. I, I think that was, yeah, the queen said that. Grief is the price we pay for love. I believe she was the one who first said that. It's one of my favorite quotes. And it essentially, it is a toll. It's a toll for your soul. Grief is your soul's toll. And it is a beautiful experience and it's br brutal. And I say that about life. Life is both beautiful and brutal and I call it brutiful. And gr grief is exactly that. And it's an, I'm not even going to say an unnecessary rite of passage. I think it's the most important rite of passage. I think it humbles us. I think it endears us to other people. I think it makes us vulnerable and I think it makes us whole. Ironically, losing someone makes us whole in a way it gives us space to sort of expand. And if you expand in a healthy way, you can expand your heart. So here's a couple quotes that really stuck with me. This is from Helen Keller. I don't know if you guys know her. She's not a SoundCloud rapper. We bereaved are not alone. We belong to the largest company in all the world, the company of those who have known suffering. And that essentially is every single person. And suffering being a cornerstone of Buddhism is something that we're all trying to avoid. And it's an un unavoidable emotion and experience. And with grief, so much of it can feel like suffering. And a lot of it is. But if you're able to sort of sit in that, and like I said, sort of make it an active experience in times when you have the energy or in times when you can give yourself a little bit more of a push and make it an make grief an active experience meaning if you're feeling really really low try with all of your will to do the opposite when i was upstate during the year that my when my mother passed away it was winter time and i went on hikes in the middle of winter it was so cold and i had already been living in la it was so cold and the coldness was an anchor for me. It was uh, an energizing anchor. And that coldness made me want to move faster to, you know, manufacture heat. But it also made me move slower. And, and in that, I was able to think and feel and experience it in a more open space. So I really love that quote. The other quote that I love says things we lost have a way of coming back to us in the end if not always in the way we expect that's from harry potter in the order of the phoenix and to me that's the most beautiful quote because it really encapsulates how i feel and what i've experienced with my both a loss uh, losses that i've endured losing my dad and losing my mom i've been looking for my dad for so long 
my mother's shown up and completely in incredible ways my mother has come through so clearly to me and I'm not somebody who is easily fooled I have an open heart and an open mind but I'm also a, an extreme skeptic I doubt everything I'm a comedian it's my nature so I'm not completely open but I am but with a little bit of a judgmental eye and if someone told me that they saw one of their dead ones or dead loved ones or past relatives before I had actually saw my mom in Italy, I'd be like, yeah, okay. Sure you did. I bet you did. I mean, I, I can't deny that you did. You said you did, so I'm going to believe you. But in my mind, I'm like, sure you did. But then when I experienced what I experienced in Italy, you could probably find that on a couple of the grief episodes back where I talk about that experience of actually seeing my mother when I was in Italy and now I know for sure that was the entire reason that I went on that trip it completely changed my philosophy on life it changed my philosophy on grieving and what it means to lose someone and and how those relationships evolve and how they're as cheesy as it sounds they really are always with us I don't mean as a ghost I don't mean as Ebenezer Scrooge I don't mean as Bill Murray from Scrooged but they're with us in some way shape and shape or form so we've kind of been discussing this in this entire episode so far how grief is a very personal experience that's one of my first lessons and thoughts on how grief can steal your Christmas <laughs> grief is a very very exper a personal experience it's so individualized and it's different for every single person and it's basically, I think, like an iPhone, how people can make their iPhones so unique and you put all your own little widgets on there and you put the apps how you want to put the apps. Grief is just like that. It's different for everybody. It looks different for everybody. It functions different for everyone. And there's no time limit. You know, that article came out um, for the DSM, which is basically the handbook of all mental disorders. And they added to it, it's a diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders and it's it's a, a book that includes everything in, included in that all the mental disorders and they've included prolonged grief in that i i think i shared that new york times article with you guys a few months back that prolonged grief is now a disorder and i just wholeheartedly disagree we can call grief a personal experience and we can say that everyone will experience it differently but to say someone who's grieving for a long period of time is a disorder based off of what? How can you yourself quantify your grief versus somebody else's? And now that's not to say if you're in the throes of depression, if you can't get out of bed, if you are immobile and not eating and it's starting to affect your health, that's a different conversation. That's a completely different conversation. But if we're talking about general grief and what it feels like to grief and in there being a time limit, they're saying anywhere over a year. If you're grieving more than a year, you have prolonged grief disorder. To me, it just sounds like an opportunity for pharmaceuticals to medicate further. And true medication for, for grief, for me, this is different for everybody, but the true medication for me has been free and it has been holistic. And it has come in the... in the way of exercise and meditation, some psilocybin, some marijuana, community, rest, sunlight, nutrition. Most of these things are free. Most of these things, if not all, have zero to little side effects, negative side effects. So the fact that, they, that they're saying that over a year you have prolonged grief, I, I want to know what they're basing that off of and I want to know what the parameters are because I've, I will be grieving for the rest of my life and anybody else out there who lost somebody, I think it's completely normal to grieve for the rest of your life. How that grief and how you interact with that grief. Now that is dependent on you and that is individual and that is your experience. And as long as your, is your health isn't being compromised, you're not losing weight or gaining weight a little bit either way, I think still is okay. And I'm not a doctor. This is all what I've experienced. I'm not suggesting this as, as 
uh, a prescription for your grief. But what I'm saying is I think there's fluctuations in everything. And I think that putting a time limit on losing somebody you love completely defies the laws of love itself. So just understand your grief is very personal. How you deal with it is your own experience and no one will experience it the way you you will. You'll find people and talk to people and be like, oh, did you experience this? And they'll be like, yeah, and there'll be similarities. But how they dealt with it versus how you deal with it are two different worlds, of course. The love you lost is different. The person you lost is different. So of course, the experience of the loss surrounding that person is gonna be different. Uh, the other way, I guess we'll call this number two, Number one, grief is a very personal experience. Don't think that you have some sort of disorder. Number two, the way to deal with grief and, and to avoid having grief steal your Christmas is to change your traditions. It's the hardest thing to do. It feels, it feels like a violation and it feels like you're cheating. At least I did. The year my dad died, my dad died in October 2018. I went away for Christmas. I have never not spent Christmas with my family ever in my life. Ever, 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 ever. From the day I was born in, in 1982 to, ni to 2018, I spent every single Christmas with my family. And when my dad died, it, it hurt me so deeply that I needed to go someplace. And that's when I did that USO tour. And we went overseas and we did um, Norway, Germany, Bahrain, Iraq, Afghanistan. And it was the single most challenging and beautiful and life-altering experience of my life. It was such a, an emotional experience. It felt really good to be able to share with people who couldn't be with their family. And I think it came at such an important and pivotal point in my grief. I couldn't be with my dad. I wanted to be with him during the holidays and I couldn't. And because of that, I felt drawn to be with people who also couldn't be with their loved ones. And the grief that they experienced, we shared in together. And, and that created such a, a beautiful experience overseas and with the shows and with everybody. It gave me lifelong friends and made me appreciate what people do and what they experience in the military, especially during the holidays and how hard it is for them to be away from everybody in a foreign country. So change your traditions, whatever that means for you. If you normally put a green tree up, try a white tree. You normally put it in front of the window, put it in your bathroom, get wild, get silly, make things different, flip Christmas on its ass, flip it upside down. If you normally go to other people's house for the holidays, have people over to your house, whatever you can do. And it's going to feel so difficult. It's going to feel wrong. It's going to feel antithetical to how you spent your holidays. And it's going to feel like you are completely cheating on your loved ones or you're being deceitful. It feels wrong, but it really helps you get over the hump. It helps you step into that new life that you essentially are em embarking on without this person in your life in the physical form. Another way, number three, is to ch uh, reminisce with your siblings. My sister and I love sharing stories about my dad. And our story has so many different perspectives depending on who you share it with and, and what that person went through. Like whatever life my sisters had with my father is different than the life I had and the experiences I had. So you're able to sort of rem remember this person from all different points of view. And it's a really cool thing. You learn new things about them after they die. And it's so wild. Like my sister and I learned how my mom had a nickname and gave her friends weed. And we were like, whoa, was Nancy in the cartel? Who was she? Puffin stuff? Maybe, maybe she was a drug mule. What was she putting in the puffin stuff? What did she fill it with? Who do you work for? <laughs> but reminiscing with my sister... Even if it feel, feels hard, it feels cathartic. And I even have a hard time sometimes being vulnerable with her because I want to be tough and I, w I don't want to make her upset. And I'm, I know she's the same way. There were so many years where I would hide my emotions and hide my tears away from her because I didn't want to put that burden on her. And now, oh, now forget it. I'll be buttering toast and I'll just, I'll just be like this. You know, you see this during the holidays. Someone's either laughing their ass off or mourning grandma. You know, I'm just over the toast. 
<laughs> my sister's like, are you convulsing? I'm like, I, 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 I. that's what we end up saying. <laughs> Whenever her and I cry, it's always because of one thing. I, I miss mom. I miss dad. And there's one time I was filling the water with a little filter on the side of the fridge. And I just like, <laughs> I didn't even grow up with one of those in the house. I just hit me. That's a thing, man. Grief is, it's like a heavyweight boxer. It's like a heavyweight boxer and you're in the ring and you are a lightweight. For the first year, woo, you're getting body punches. You're getting the uppercuts and the front punch and the elbow to the jaw and all those very specific MMA moves that you guys probably don't know about the way I do. But the double kick knee high shin drop to your soul that grief gives you. Woo! So reminisce with your siblings to make all of that a little bit easier. That's how you can sort of keep this person alive. And that's actually number four on the list is to keep them alive. Keep them alive however you can. Keep them alive with photos. Drink their favorite drinks. Make their favorite drinks for the holidays and salute to them. Wear their clothes. Donate their clothes. Repurpose their clothes. My aunt Janet ended up turning one of my mom's shirts into a pillow and found little pieces of her shirt and put it on different ornaments for our Christmas tree and go to their watering holes, go to their bars, go to their favorite restaurants and talk to them. You can be that crazy person that's talking to yourself. I usually say good night and I love you and I miss you to my mom and dad every night. Do whatever you need to do to keep them alive. Keep them alive and that relationship evolves. The relationship with your loved ones will evolve even though they're gone and you discover new things about them. You discover new things about yourself. And I I realize I have an advantage because I have my mother's diary. Turns out she was pissed off most every single day. Turns out she wasn't so happy with us. (laughs) Turns out my mom kind of fucking was stressed out from us. Turns out having kids wasn't all she thought it was going to be. And sometimes her husband was a pain in the ass. And I learned all that from Nancy's diary. Maybe I'll, I'll read a chapter or two on the next Grief Survival Guide episode. There are ways to keep them alive. There are ways to keep their spirit a part of the holiday and to create a new tradition while including them. My sister and I will go to Change a Pace, which is my dad's watering hole in Syracuse, New York. Used to be a house. Now it's a bar. It makes the most amazing wings and well drinks. And Joe Peluso had a stool there. He had a drink. He called his drinks a smash. Give me another smash. He would make it in one single glass he'd keep all the limes and when the limes filled the glass it was time to go home because each lime represented a drink my dad had drunk math upstate new york drunk math but find ways to incorporate who they were into who you are now and it's a really beautiful and easy way to sort of keep them circulating in your world i do think it's important to figure out a way to let them go it's necessary. You have to. And there's this beautiful saying, if you love something enough, you have to let it go. And my mom had that hanging in our hallway. I remember reading it every day before I went downstairs. And I didn't realize how important of a lesson that was going to be for me as an adult. Just this random little thrift store frame that my mom had hanging in the hallway that I saw every day for years and years and years and years. And just knowing that if you love something enough, you have to learn to let it go in order to let it grow and to allow it to flourish. And in the pursuit of love, any kind of love, but we're talking specifically in this episode for myself, I'm talking about parental love. It's such a deep, beautiful and complicated relationship and that love is so eternal and so many of us aren't fortunate enough to have that from a young age and I was I I had parents that loved me very very much and our relationship was so beautiful and letting them go was the hardest thing I had to do but they're still able to be a part of my life I've learned different ways to keep them around and to talk to them and to feel that they're still a part of my world, but you do have to find a way to let go of, of them so that you're able to get that rite of passage 
to become that uh, untethered adult to have that experience for yourself because you in turn will be that for somebody else and we try so hard and we grip so tightly to the past I don't think you need to let it go completely but like the quote my mother had that I found after she died by Henry Ellis who I believe is an author it said that basically the beauty of life lies in a mingling of letting go and holding on something to that matter and I think that is true with grief you have to let them go you can hang on to parts of them but you have to find a way to really release them and that release can be a little bit like breathing like respiration where you breathe in and then you let go there's the ability in breathing in to hang on to parts of them but you breathe out and let go a little bit more each time and I think if you look at the process of grief kind of like that ebb and flow that in and outtake that breathing There is still a symbiotic relationship. There's still a reciprocal relationship. It's not a complete letting go. It's not so black and white. Grief is not so black and white. It is a beautifully gray zone and it's constantly evolving and it can really, really be the most important lesson and experience of your life throughout your entire life. I think we all have a little bit of prolonged grief and I think number five of my list of how to avoid having the grief steal your Christmas is to get out and be merry. It's the holiday season. And even if it's not the holiday season, this can be lessons and tips and guides for your entire year for all types of grief, not just losing people, losing your job, losing a house, uh, losing your self, losing your marriage. Grief has so many different areas. It's such a wide spectrum. And all of these can be applied. They're applicable in so many different aspects of life. But really, the holidays can be very nostalgic. Christmas can be a very triggering time of year. And we get lost in it. And I think it's good to get lost in the holiday. Get lost in the Yuletide. Get lost in the holiday Christmassy drinks and the desserts and the parties and the decor and the giving and the merriment That's a word I feel you can only use during this time. Any other time of the year, you sound like a goofball, but you can say merriment in December. I think that would also be a great strain for a sativa gummy. Why not call it Christmas merriment? There's so much gay Yuletide, I can't take it, and I love it so much. I love Hallmark Christmas movies. I love the smell of peppermint, and I love the smell of cinnamon, and I love Christmas morning. I love Christmas night. I love the lights. I love just giving and seeing my niece and nephew open everything up and feel so excited about all the toys I don't need that cost money that other kids probably make who don't have the family that we have and I feel so bad for their grief but I'm happy to see my niece and nephew enjoy it there's so many ways to enjoy this time hell you know what you know what would be really fun I, I kind of want to do this is to get a group of people who can't sing and go caroling be the worst carolers ever wouldn't that be fun that would be so much fun <laughs> to be the worst carolers. No, well, no, well, no, well, no. Born is the king of Israel. I probably shouldn't say that now. It's a heated world, but I really think getting lost in the holiday season can help you deal with grief. You just have to relinquish. You have to let go and surrender to the freaking holiday. You have to wrap yourself in buffalo plaid and grab a hot cocoa from Starbucks. Maybe not Starbucks. I would do a small business. I support small coffee businesses and small coffee shops across this country. I will drive a mile or walk a mile before I go to a Starbucks. Mark my word. Four reels. If that's the only option, sometimes I won't even drink the coffee. And yes, that is a, a shot at Starbucks. It tastes burnt. It tastes burnt and, and it tastes like there's cow chips in it. But get lost in it and enjoy it and really find ways to 
maybe give for another family and find a way to help another family and, and offer your time. We can go through the list real quick. Um, again, this was how grief stole Christmas and, and ways to deal and, and mitigate how grief can be something that can rob you of a really good time and ways to sort of find some peace with it. We talked a little bit in the beginning about how it's a personal experience. It's just for you and it's not a right or wrong thing. As long as you are recognizing and hopefully keeping tabs on your health, I don't believe there's a time limit to grief. Number two, change your traditions. Get get a little silly. You have to really flip Christmas upside down. Flip the holiday upside down. Change the table setting. Change. Put your aunt outside. Make a make a creepy shed, and put the creepy relatives out there. Hell, put the children's table on the front lawn with a ring camera. Let's have fun. Uh, number three, reminisce with your siblings and your family about the one you lost. Tell stories and maybe reveal things. Oh, he never told you this, but did you know that mom one day da 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 whatever the thing is, share it. Give away all their dirty secrets. Number four, keep them alive however you can. Photos and, and, and drink their drinks. Wear their clothes. Donate their clothes. Go to their favorite restaurants. There's so many ways that you can have a relationship with someone once they're gone. And number five is get out and be merry. I know it sounds cheesy, but I believe that all of us sort of hang on to when we're trying to reconnect with the magic that we experienced so much in our childhood. And I think you you have to get down and play with the kid that you once were. And you have to get into the snow and, and roll around and make snow angels and, and really double down on the holiday. And don't let grief steal it from you. While there's a way to honor your emotions, there's also a way to push through that and to be able to give yourself a chance and an opportunity to be able to enjoy this holiday and to reminisce and to remember that even though this might be the hardest time of your life, that you are learning something and there's a gift on the other side of it. That this grief and the way that you feel so alone is teaching you something about the importance of being able to appreciate what you have and who you who you love and the people that are in your life. So I hope this episode was helpful for you guys. We're asking and have been asking during these episodes, where do you think we go when we die? If you want to email us that, you can get as silly as you want with that. Comedy at gmail.com. And if you guys have any suggestions for future grief episodes or people that maybe I can interview, books I can read, pass that along to the email as well. You can give us a call too, 513-916-0930 if you want to share a story about your loved one as a way to keep them alive with a story or, you know, reminisce with your siblings. And if a story comes up, shoot us a text message or leave us a voicemail, 513-916-0930. And I hope you guys find a way to enjoy this holiday and find a way to remember that while they are gone, there are pieces of them that you're going to carry with you for the rest of your life. And however you need to do that is essentially your choice and your journey. And grief is a lifelong journey. And I hope it gives you the way it has for me gives you lessons and all the perspective that you need it's not a perfect process and I'm not a perfect person but I will say that losing both of my parents has taught me everything about love and one of the biggest lessons in love is dealing with loss and how you can armor yourself and be a more loving, compassionate, and present person in the lives of the ones that you love who are still with you. And don't forget that you still have people in your life. And so go have a freaking eggnog drink with the aunt who's got halitosis and two squirrels. She's a little lonely. Give her some attention this year. Love you guys. Bye.